Hello and welcome to The Americano Show. I am delighted to be joined here at the Spectator's offices by Nate Silver, who I probably don't need to introduce, but I will say that he is the world's most famous election prognosticator. Uh, And he has written a book, a new book, uh, called On the Edge, The Art of Risking Everything. Uh, It's a fascinating read, Nate. Uh, And it's a pretty eclectic book, I think, to use an overused word. Um, First of all, I'd like to say, during an election year, when everybody wants to talk to you about an American election, I know your your book, uh, The Signal and the Noise, came out in 2012, which was another election year. But that was probably more related to what you do or what you're most known for. Um, whereas this feels like a bit of a gamble because you're talking about gambling and you're talking about risk. Yeah, look, if I never had to cover another election, I would still have a happy life. I'd be perfectly happy with that. I don't really like um, the people in American politics <laughs> very much, right? I, I think sometimes I'm too much in the spotlight for this stuff. Um, trying to provide like a more arm's length kind of rational voice to have a little bit of, of fun with it to help explain explain probability and things like that to people. But like, um, like... You know, I am not like a politics person. I got into politics because I was playing online poker and the U.S. Congress passed a law to basically ban online poker or ban payment processing to online poker in 2006. And that that compelled me to follow politics more. I wanted the people who passed that law to be voted out of office, which they were, by the way, Um, you know, with more time on my hands with poker, (laughs) no longer a viable source of income. Um, It's 2008. I'm living in Chicago. I go on the University of Chicago. Barack Obama, a very different type of politician than the George Bush, John Kerry era is running for president. It's a big kind of money ball, data driven era in the U.S. And so it kind of, yeah, it it would seem like it was all plotted out very carefully, but it was more my my frustration with political coverage being very kind of momentum and vibes driven and not very quantitative at all. And 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 to my surprise, it kind of was the right time to get into American politics at like 2008 onward has been a fascinating sometimes exasperating era for you know for elections in the u.s and and it's been fun to have a a, you know a seat on the train for it but the idea for this book was to pivot out of politics um and instead i've gotten gotten swept back in i suppose you mentioned the book that people get very angry with you about your political prognostications uh less so with sports is this book in some ways an attempt to explain to people that it's the same thing for sure. And when we say the same thing, that's true in some ways and not in others, right? Like, obviously, politics are, are much higher stakes, although the fact that sports is so popular around the world is something I think goes taken for granted sometimes. Um, but they are like both strategic games in the sense of game theory, where you have two sides trying to optimize their outcome against a smart and competitive opponent. Um, you know, they are both fields that lend themselves relatively well to data-driven analysis in the sense that you have a lot of structure, election data in the U.S. and the U.K. for that matter is, you know, it's good data. We um, understand how elections work. We understand the rules of the system. And that makes for, you know, more um, translatable problems as far as forecasting or or prediction go. Um, But yeah, look, in politics, especially in the U.S., you hear over and over, this is the most important election of your lifetime, that it's very built on grievance. I think people have trouble understanding the role that like things like luck can play in politics, where if Donald Trump turns his head in a different direction, then Donald Trump may have had more than a bullet graze his ear right now. Mm. Um, in 2000, the outcome came down to essentially random ballot design choices in the state of Florida and weather patterns and things like that between Al Gore and George Bush. Um, people seem reluctant to embrace the idea that maybe their election wins aren't just by divine right, yeah. um, but are by twists of faith that are hard to foresee in advance. Well, that's, yeah, I mean, nobody can predict the future is, <laughs> is the obvious point. But, yeah. uh, but I think w- what I'd like to start talking to you about properly is, is this division you have between uh, the river and the village in the book. And this is in the bit about gambling. Um, for those who don't know, please explain to us what is the river, who are riverians, what is the village, who are the villagers? So I'll start kind of in the, in the U.S., metaphor, because the book is partly about America and what makes America weird. Um, (laughs) uh, So the village is kind of the East Coast establishment, which at the moment is very politically progressive. So the New York Times and Harvard University, you know, when a Democrat's in charge, the White House and the nonprofits and the think tanks around that academia, certainly. Um, So the village is all about kind of the collective good in a kind of progressive democratic framing of what that means. Um, It's pretty risk averse. People in the village are afraid of losing their social status, of being 
of being canceled and losing their influence. Mm -hmm. um, the river you can think of as basically Silicon Valley, Las Vegas, Miami. It's the world of calculated risk taking. It's people who are extremely individualistic, who are sometimes contrarian to the point of being difficult, um, but who combine being really analytical with being really, really competitive. Um, so where the UK is, I mean, I guess the UK in some ways, to extend the metaphor, is like east of the US East Coast, right? You come over here, and I, I went to school in London for a year. Um, but you see subtle things where there's more paternalism or more risk aversion in the in the UK, right? Yes. You go to the tube, and there are the guards on the subway, so you don't trip and fall into the into the tube, which I suppose makes sense, right? Um, you know, you go to the store, and, and, and you're trying to buy beer, and after 11 p.m., the beer is boarded up and things like that. You go to the Uber, and there's a blinking light if you if your seatbelt isn't on so it's just like a little <laughs> bit more hand holding here and but less but less entrepreneurship i mean the number of um the number of unicorn companies in one region of the u.s silicon valley is like 5x more than in all of the uk um mm. and you still have capital and venture capital fleeing to to the americas and obviously that's to do with the, the structure of american society capitalism and so on but also do you think it's genetic because Americans, you know, a lot of you uh, came here because you were exploring a new world. You were, you, they were the pilling people willing to take a risk that probably a lot of Europeans weren't. Yeah, I mean, look, um, Las Vegas was founded kind of as an offshoot of like the gold rush, basically, right? Where you had people go to California first, and you it spin off into Nevada to mine silver. Um, so yeah, look, people have always selected in the U.S. to um, to move there because they wanted to find kind of fortune potentially. And that pioneer spirit, I think, is is still a big part of the story. And Silicon Valley attracts like talent from all over the world. Um, at the same time, I also think that there are more boring answers like that in a constitutional system where the U.S. Constitution is hard to change. Um, there are more veto points. Um, so we tend to have, by default, kind of fewer regulations. We also have a, a conservative Supreme Court that tends not to like tends not to like liberal progressive laws, for example. And so um so yeah, I mean, you know, things like product safety laws, things like free speech. I'm a big free speech fan, so I'm good with that part, right? Yeah. Um but yeah, you see a divergence where um, you know, I was a college student here in two thousand, I guess, and back then the US and the UK had roughly an equal GDP per capita within a couple thousand pounds. Um now the U.S. is about seventy-six thousand dollars per year per capita, and the U.K. is forty-six thousand. So you've had a huge divergence. On the flip side, um, life expectancies in the U.K. are three or four years longer than in the U.S., despite mm. the countries seeming like sister countries in a lot of different ways. So at, at some point, um, Europe, maybe even more so than the U.K., but also the U.K., I think, kind of took an off ramp away from maybe growth towards sustainability or quality of life. And the U.S. is still on the accelerator toward toward growth, growth, growth. Well, and as you mentioned about gambling, the the U.S. has a uh, an odd relationship with gambling because online gambling here has been uh, pretty legal for a long time now. Uh, it's just, it's coming back into legality now. I, I'm not quite sure where we are at the latest, but... Uh, in, the, in the U.S., gambling is very much done at the state level. And so, um, <clears throat> so you've had uh, sports betting is now present in, I think, about half the states in the U.S. Um, you know, online poker is only five states or so. Yeah, the U.K. is, it's a weird role reversal, right? I mean, um, you know, the U.K. is, I think, more rational in some ways about gambling. Yeah, it's you go to like, and there's like a little casino on on the main road or something, right? It's like not really that big a deal. Whereas in the U.S., it's like we can be very puritanical on the one hand, but then we have the biggest, you know, gambling site in the world, maybe tied with Macau in Las Vegas. It's like some type of, type of shrine to American capitalism or consumerism in Vegas is bringing in record revenues. And so we, we're a little schizophrenic about gambling in the U.S., for sure. And I found your book to be a good guide to how to be a risk taker, um, because you yourself are a Rivarian. You identify as a Rivarian. Yeah, I, I would say, yeah. Well, I'm probably a little bit of both. A little bit of both. Uh, but you have uh, gambled. You've been a poker player. You have bet on sports. Uh, and even for a person who's very well off, uh, very large sums of money. Um, did you, do you, would you say you're low in neuroticism, which is kind of a key thing to be a successful Rivarian? I think I'm pretty low in neuro. I mean, so the people, it's people who have high openness to experience, um, but low neuroticism, right? I, I tend not to dwell on negative emotionality. And these things are kind of hard to find because typically if you think of, um, 
in the United States, Democrats or liberals or progressives, whatever you want to call them, they're the ones who are more multicultural and more open to different uh, sexualities and genders and things like that, and more open to immigration, more open in general. But they tend to be pretty neurotic. <laughs> they tend to, you know, have a lot of hangups about a lot of different things, um, have lower mental health, at least self-reported. Um, whereas conservatives are just the opposite. So if you can kind of combine like the openness to experience with the lack of neuroticism, like that's a skill set that I think is, you know, helps people to thrive in in gambling type tasks. Mm. And does it help them to understand value? Because appreciating value or expected value is a key part of being able to take risks successfully. I mean, I think in both senses of the term value. I mean, yeah, obviously, you know, what you're trying to calculate in some level is, will I on average come out ahead if I make this this bet or take this risk, expected value? Um, I also think though people in the river are often quite philosophical. Um, you know, someone like Peter Thiel is not for everybody, but he's certainly a very literate guy who knows kind of the, you know, his history of European enlightenment, enlightenment and beyond philosophy and postmodern philosophy and things like that. Um, the people who are pretty widely read for the most part um, and who are trying to kind of understand what like the governing rules of the system are. And they're less kind of, they're less ad hoc. I mean, one critique you can make of the village is that everything is so political. It's all about you know what's good for partisan purposes, then you kind of rationalize later on why it fits into your paradigm. Um, mm. And the Riverians at their best, which they often are not, are, I think, more long-term and strategic focused. And do you think with the tech revolution, these types of Riverians like Peter Thiel or Elon Musk or Sam Altman, uh, Sam Bankman-Friedman, what you talked about, uh, Sam Bankman-Fried, I should say, um, they are the sort of people who are pulling, uh, not not by themselves, but their success is what's causing a lot of problems in America because because of the tech revolution, these people have had such astronomical success so quickly that the river is sort of getting further away from the village. I think, so, you know, the top VC firms in Silicon Valley probably make returns of about 20% per year. And because they keep reinvesting those returns, then that grows and grows and grows. Um, you know, if you invest in the S&P 500, then you make seven or eight percent per year on average. So 20 percent compounding means that you have an exponential increase in in wealth and power. And even if you're kind of like a somewhat unrepentant University of Chicago educated capitalist like like I am, I suppose, then then you have to worry when kind of that much power is concentrated in so few hands where they become more powerful than than governments in a lot of ways. I mean, you kind of have Elon Musk kind of functioning as a as a quasi governmental entity <laughs> in certain ways now where like Brit Britain or excuse me Brazil is banning Twitter or attempting to which I you know I don't approve of but like but it's almost like he's like a state power it's like embargoing a country in 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 a war or something like that um so I think we have to think carefully about that especially with AI AI is not the traditional startup where you have a garage somewhere in Los Altos, California, and Steve Jobs makes a new computer or something, right? This is a case where um, where the already powerful companies that have enough computing power and capital to train models for six months at a time at a very high density of, of compute um, are, are coming out ahead. It's the Microsofts and the Googles that are, are gaining as a result of this. And is that why uh, the village is, necessary, is so necessary? Because if AI is, as, as you mentioned in the book, the, the nuclear bomb of the, the technological revolution, uh, we do need institutions of government that tend to be more village than river yeah. to to moderate it, to control it, and to actually regulate it. Yeah, look, Sam Altman, who's a smart guy, he's not Sam bankman fried or something like that, right? But he'll say that, like, actually, oh, this technology could um, potentially destroy civilization if it's misaligned in the wrong way. If we develop things that are smarter than people and very capable of than people and they don't like people very much, then um, then that could be not very good for the human race, right? And he'll say that, I guess, to his credit for being honest, but like, but I'm not sure that like any private enterprise should have the power to like, um, to, you know, press a button and run some non-zero risk of like destroying civilization with the next model training run. And again, mm. I'm someone who most of the time, 90... 5% of the time was like, yeah, I think these regulations probably do, you know, are not doing that good necessarily. But this is a case where I think um, where we should have a broad consensus that like that, you know, having smarter regulation is helpful. But smart is also the key. Um, you know, it's a little bit of a kind of prisoner's dilemma where, um, you know, if we overly regulate AI, then China might develop it or some other country might develop it, um, mm. you know, or you might have people who develop it 
in the gray market. Um, you know, you have Elon Musk, for example, with his Grok engine on Twitter is, is, you know, making pictures of naughty stuff that like um, ChatGPT or, or whatever won't do. But like, so you, the, you know, there are, to use again the nuclear metaphor, there are some potential arms race type dynamics. Mm. And the uh, relationship that seems to be developing between a lot of, not a lot, but a few very important tech entrepreneurs and Donald Trump um, suggests that there is a, a rejection of the democratic village uh, now, and you are seeing uh, almost a hatred of it in a lot of these tech circles. Yeah. Does that tie into what you're writing about in the book? Yeah, look, I think if you took a survey of everybody in the river, you would still get more Democrats and Republicans, or at least more Harris voters and Trump voters, right. um, because like they tend to be pretty educated people. And in the U.S., we have this big educational divide where the educated classes tend to vote Democratic in the U.S. Um, but absolutely, you've seen at the tip of the spear people like Elon Musk, Peter Thiel, um, um, you know, Bill Ackman as a hedge fund manager against the presidents of MIT and Stanford, or not Stanford, MIT and Harvard and Penn. Mm -hmm. um, you see more open conflict and. I think it's partly <clears throat> personality clash. They see uh, they see the village as being very collectivist and risk givers, and they're very risk on and individualist. Um, it's partly kind of narrow economic self interest, where um, you know if you read the reporting on Elon Musk before some of the culture war stuff, he was just mad that the Biden administration did not invite Tesla to various EV initiatives because they were not unionized. Yeah. Um, and he was mad about Lena Khan regulation at the FEC and he, and they're mad about, you know, high taxation in California and other places and the kind of demonization in the liberal media of, of billionaires. You know, I don't know why they're so worried. They're billionaires. You can, it's okay to be not be sympathetic <laughs> if you're a billionaire. Um, and then I think they kind of like find the culture war stuff, Later on, it's like I think I think if you are someone who, um, who you you know you you kind of feel like oh I have to be a good progressive Democrat right and then you kind of start you know you start getting pilled a little bit and you feel kind of naughty right now you're allowed to like say all those things I think the kind of COVID era or if you want to call it the COVID slash kind of wokeness era mm. in the U.S. I think a lot of you know, particularly middle-aged and older men, I'm probably susceptible to this myself, right? Um, felt like you weren't allowed to say certain things for a few years and kind of once things change, there's a regime change, then you may overcompensate in the other direction for a period of time. I suppose someone like uh, the comedian and TV presenter Bill Maher would be a good example of somebody who has sort of become increasingly closer to the Trump worldview. I think in some ways, but I think there are also nuances and, and subtleties here, right? I mean, the thing is, like, if I think about, like, bluffing or strategic communication. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes people say, well, I'm a little bit more moderate on this issue, you know, trans rights or Gaza, or, you know, think of any controversial issue that you can, right? And sometimes it's a way to signal that like, um, that like, oh, actually I'm conservative. I'm just kind of like saying this as a, as a dog whistle or a hint, but like, you know, I'm somebody who unlike, you know, a lot of these key issues, you know, if you ask me, what's your stance on on, you know, the war in Gaza, right? I'll say like, I don't know, I feel really sympathetic for both <laughs> the Israeli and the Palestinian people. And I, I'm, I'm kind of torn, right? It's like not like a dog whistle or anything else, just like actually how I happen to feel. And I think, you know, there are people who are true moderates or, or uncertain or just say, I don't know, this is kind of above my pay grade on some issues. Mm. Um, and they're the ones that you often like don't hear from very much. And do they make predicting elections, are they the hardest thing to predict? Because they tend to be perhaps a bit more contrarian. Yeah, uh, a little bit. I mean, you worry less about, tribal. You worry about the voters that you don't hear from. Um, you know, on the one hand, obviously any party would rather have more enthusiastic voters than less. On the other hand, sometimes that enthusiasm translates into being more willing to take a poll. Um, so you get sampling error that um, that you reach the enthusiastic people, you don't reach the unenthusiastic people, but the unenthusiastic people still still wind up voting potentially. Mm. There's a lot of the book is about Bitcoin. Um, are you a believer in Bitcoin? Um, I think the blockchain is an interesting technology. It's one of the more interesting technologies of of the decade, I suppose. I I don't think right now the applications of it are are tremendously world altering necessarily. I mean, you know, right now it serves various functions. I mean, like you know, the technology of NFTs is a pretty cool technology to provide d digital ownership of, of digital assets and proof of um, the chain of custody and things like that. It's like, you know, and, but like most technologies, it takes like 50 years to figure out kind of what the long-term applications are. Look, I think Bitcoin is partly, partly an ideological movement. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that 
um, after the financial crisis that we are worried about governments printing money and we're worried about fiat currency. And if fully realized, it'd be quite a radical idea, right? To have a financial system that's decentralized and based on um, trust on the blockchain instead of by government fiat. I mean, that's, you know, that's a very radical idea if that were able to come to fruition. Right now, it's mostly used as a form of, of gambling, I'd say, though. It is gambling, isn't it? It's, it's uh, it, I mean, the idea of its value is not properly understood, even perhaps by the people who most believe in it. To some extent, it's trying to predict social behavior among kind of people in your in your social class, right? It's trying to figure out what's the timing of like surges and busts. Um, you know, the game theory dynamics are actually are actually quite interesting where even, I mean, even if you set aside like Bitcoin for now, something like the bubbles that we see in like GameStop or AMC stock, for example, where it's like coordinate coordinated efforts to like undermine all these hedge funds and, and you know, I'm not sure if you even say manipulate prices, but like to squeeze short sellers. It, it's like, quite fascinating dynamics that are a product of like the the internet age and meme culture and the way that you know these are mostly younger people and younger men in particular the way they tend to like a scheme and bond together so that part of the, uh, that part of it i think is like quite interesting and it thrives on distrust all those things thrive on distrust with with the meme stocks it was different distrust of the financial system with bitcoin it's this idea that central banks have too much power For is, that, sure. is that the prisoner's dilemma at work well, the prisoner's dilemma occurs when there's when there's a lack of trust. Um, so ironically, you know, if you have people, if you have different traders, there are relatively few bigwigs, for example, in a, in a stock like AMC or, or GameStop. Um, you know, if they can coordinate and say, we're not going to sell until next week, um, then you can actually squeeze, get a short squeeze. And you can actually have that be profitable. Um, so that requires like local trust and global distrust, I think. Um and maybe we kind of trust our local communities now that we self-select a little bit more and, and to, in online spaces, you can kind of pick and choose who your friends are. And you may have a tremendous amount of like loyalty to them, but um, but distrust of kind of the sovereign, right? Distrust of like, you know, all the institutions in the U.S., I suppose in the U.K., I don't know the data as well. But, you know, a government and academia and media and mm. the church, everything but the um, but the military, we've seen decline in trust in the U.S. I think we do, we tend to be a bit up, you know, they say uh, politics is downstream from culture or whatever the phrase is. And uh, I think in Britain, we just tend to be a bit downstream on both from America. Perhaps. I mean, um, you know, look, it's still a culture that is compared to the U.S. relatively less partisan. The fact that you see these big swings, you know, to and from labor and Lib Dems will surge and recline and Nigel Farage. I mean, you know, I think Americans are or maybe I wouldn't speak for other Americans, you know, you know, I'm somewhat envious of having a system that seems to have healthy multi-party competition. As someone who likes risk or who's interested in risk and, and doesn't mind taking quite big risks, uh, presumably, and your latest uh, writings about this suggest this, you might be reluctant to take risks on predicting this election because it's so unusual in so many ways. Well, look, we have a, a model that we publish every day. Um, and I, you know, I kind of made a calculated risk that like um, it's worth doing this as a way to build an audience for the newsletter that I'm writing, Silver Bulletin. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so far the reception has been really good. I mean, um, you know, the subscription based model, if you have content that's differentiated and specialized is is a really good business. It's much better than the ad supporting business and the economics of, of the news industry in the U.S. where remnant ads don't pay very much. So, like, I'm happy I did it. I understand that if we by Election Day have Trump as an 80-20 favorite and Harris wins or vice versa. Um, it won't be great for the business, but like that's that's a risk I'm taking going in. And I, I can't I can't control that. All I can do is make the best best bet, so to speak, that I can and set the best odds that I can. Uh, and there's been a minor controversy uh, over 538, the company you, you set up and yeah. you sold to Disney. Um, and it seems as though they were using a model that they needed to update. Can you explain what happened? So 538... Um, was the brand I founded in 2008. Um, it was bought by Disney um, in 2013, first with ESPN, the sports company, and then ABC News 2018. And um, about a year and change ago, a year and a half ago, they laid most of the staff off. And then my contract, I wasn't technically laid off, but my contract was going to expire anyway. And we just kind of like let it expire. Um, they hired a new person, but I sold them the name 538. They I kept the models that I designed. They were just licensed to Disney. I know it's like more detail than people want. But basically, they hired a new guy to build a new model, and he designed a model that was buggy and broken. 
they can try to be euphemistic about it and say, oh, there were just assumptions that were wrong. No, this model was broken and should not have been published. Mm. Um, and they were cagey about replacing it. I mean, apparently the staff at 538, and I still dearly love like the people that, not the new guy, but the people who were there originally. Yeah. Um, they're really hardworking and, and good journalists. Um, but yeah, and they, and they kind of changed the model when Biden replaced terrorists, but they took a month before they published it and then tried to, um, tried to kind of mm, obfuscate the fact that it had been radically transformed and radically changed. And so this is kind of against the values of, of data journalism, as I used to call it, or, or journalism in general. Uh, these models are hard to build. But I imagine they're very hard to build, but I also imagine almost impossible to change from Biden to Harris. How do you, obviously, it's, I realize it's very complicated, but how do you change that because it's such a substantial thing and yet it's not a complete rupture? It's actually pretty easy, right? I okay. You basically change one cell in a spreadsheet and say, you know, candidate number 42, which is Kamala Harris, instead of candidate number 26, which is, which is Joe Biden. And then it kind of feeds in all the all the Biden or the Harris Trump polling data instead of Biden Trump. Now, we did wait for about a week until she became the de facto, not the official yet, but the de facto Democratic nominee. So Biden dropped out and I forget which day it was, right? A day later, she secured de facto the nomination. And so a week after that, we turned back on the model. Um, maybe a bit prematurely, she was still rising in the polls at that point. Um, but look, I mean, the challenge is more that we're almost having like we're almost having like a snap election. You know, you guys are used to that. We're not used to like a snap election in yeah. the U.S. And so you can argue that the assumptions that are embedded in the model about like this two year long election process that we have don't apply as much. And there's probably more like intrinsic uncertainty. Yeah. Um, and you have other crazy stuff. You have this assassination attempt against the former president. Right. You have RFK Jr., entering and exiting the race. Um, you have this catastrophic debate for Joe Biden. So it's been an incredibly strange set of news cycles. The model's doing the best it can. I mean, ironically, it kind of defaults towards saying basically 50-50. Um, you know, after the debate, which is in a week, um, maybe the, the first, maybe the only debate, that's where you might actually have more confidence in saying, oh, we actually um, can lean toward one direction or another, which direction I wouldn't want to guess right now. And I mean, usually the pompous thing to say about uh, presidential debates is that there may be a crucial moment, but if there yeah. isn't, it's not going to make much difference. But I think because of the circumstances of this election, is it fair to say this election, this debate will be much more de decisive? Yeah, look, you're compressing two years of campaign into five months, basically. So if you want to look at it heuristically, maybe everything is like four times more important. Um, but also I think Harris... Um, you know, has had kind of a a glide path in August where she, I think, did a very good job winning the nomination. I think gave a very good speech at the convention. Um, but it's had, for the most part, like pretty friendly media coverage. Now you see more scrutiny about her relative lack of doing like candid interviews in the press, for example, in the U.S. Um, but none of that matters except as much as the debates, right? Um, where, I mean, that first debate, People, anyone who says the debates don't matter, like, okay, you just had one of the most pivotal moments in American political history <laughs> happen. What was it just, you know, eight weeks ago or six weeks ago or whatever? Yeah. Um, yeah. And the fact that, like, you know, um, probably both Harris and Trump think they're going to win that debate potentially. Um, I, I think they both can't kind of live down the expectations entirely. Um, and, <clears throat> well, no, I mean, it's, it's going to be, it might be the most important remaining day of the election. Yeah. Another thing that people often say don't really matter that much is vice presidential nominees. Um, again, in this election, would you say they matter more? I think they matter more because people are very reminded of the fact that um, Joe Biden just literally was replaced by his vice president in the middle of the campaign. And um, if Donald Trump looks the wrong way or the guy, you know, is able to get another shot, you never know what happens in, in, in this year. Um, mm. So there's heightened scrutiny, as I think there should be. I mean, if you're if you become vice president or even named on a ticket, your odds of becoming president at some point, even though the VP job itself is kind of ceremonial, um, go way, 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 way up, right? Um, so people should pay attention. Um, hey, look, I think um, J.D. Vance is probably not a very smart pick. I mean, J.D. Vance was a pick that Trump made at a time after he had um, just had the assassination attempt, right? And it was still Joe Biden, and he was really struggling with, like, Nancy Pelosi and other Democrats. And... You know, by the reporting, they kind of thought they had the race in the bag. So they're like, hey, why not? Let's pick J.D. Vance. He'll extend our kind of MAGA timeline. He'll kind of troll the Democrats mm. a little bit. He's a smart guy. You know, the kind of Silicon Valley Riverians will will like him as a fellow traveler, so to speak. Um, 
and let themselves get very flat footed. And he was branded as weird by Democrats. I think he, um, I don't know. He's only been a senator for two years. I think Ohio's not really a swing state anymore. I think not the most natural political talent. Um, so I think that was probably a, a fairly bad pick. I mean, on the Democratic side, um, Tim Walls was popular at first. I think maybe you're having a little bit of a sell by date. You see Harris lagging, not behind, but you see Pennsylvania stubbornly remaining, you know, a one point race. Yeah. Um, and to have had the governor of Pennsylvania, who's very popular there, Josh Shapiro on the ticket, if you had an extra two points in Pennsylvania right now, if you're Kamala Harris, then you could breathe a lot easier in the Electoral College. Would it be simplistic to say Waltz is a village pick, Vance is a Riverian pick? I think, like, Waltz was the consensus pick of the Democratic Party, for sure, right? Nancy Pelosi, who has political instincts that are pretty good most of the time, you know, wanted Tim Walls. John Fetterman wanted Tim Walls. Bernie Sanders wanted him. Um, you know, I think Shapiro is seen as a guy who has, like, a little bit more ego. It's it's always been hard for presidential candidates to pick VPs that, that overshadow them, right? Mm. Um you know, Obama, well, although Obama wasn't at too much risk of being <laughs> overshadowed, I suppose, but they tend to be pretty bland, I think. Sarah um, Palin would be an obvious. Sarah Palin, okay, that would be the exception, right? Possibly, yeah. Uh, but that didn't go very well for John McCain. <laughs> no. Exactly. So, yeah, she probably doesn't help the Riverian case for high-risk VP picks. Uh, and given that we know that luck is an important factor in, in these things. And people talk about October surprises uh, in deciding elections. How often would you say October surprises have decided elections? And that presumably is all down to luck. Yeah, if you have some, you know, some oil tanker boycott in the Gulf War or things like that, right? Even things like what the weather forecast is in election day in different parts of Pennsylvania can potentially affect things. I mean, in an ordinary campaign, then I'd be saying, oh, things actually get locked in a little bit earlier you know so for example part of it's because of early voting voting's actually starting today in in north carolina for example so there are votes being cast i don't know quite what time it is in the u.s i'm on jet lag still but like there are probably there have at this moment been votes cast now in the election um but again with this kind of quasi snap election compressed time frame then obviously october is potentially magnified Nate Silver, thank you very much for coming on to the Americano podcast. I do hope we'll get you on again. Of course. Thank you so much.